Hey there, thanks so much for tuning in to this message from Faith Community. While you're here, let us know where you're joining from in the comments and share anything that sticks out to you throughout the message. We hope you're encouraged and inspired to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. We've been in a series called Sunday School Stories, where we've been taking a look at stories throughout Scripture, primarily the Old Testament. We've looked at uh, Moses in the burning bush, Joshua in the battle of Jericho, Gideon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the Tower of Babel. And this week, we're going to take a look at Daniel in the lion's den. And we're really just seeing how God used everyday, average, broken, ordinary people to do some extraordinary things and that he's the hero of the story and we're not. Right, That our goal is not to be Daniel or to be David or to be Moses, but to be who God's called us to be and see what he wants to do in us and through us for this time in which we live. I really look at, at these stories and I see how is it speaking to who we are, but how we live in the context that God has placed us. Although the timing is different, a lot of the circumstances and the issues that we face are pretty much the same. Daniel in the lion's den is no exception, and uh, I was really thinking through this and thought, I wonder how many of us have studied this story, or how many have watched Veggie Tales, or how many of us have just thought, yeah, it's a lion's den, he gets put in, he comes out, but have we taken a look at it really any deeper, or maybe you've never heard it at all? So I wanted to give a little backstory to Daniel. Day, uh, day David, his name is Brian, not David, but uh, he spoke on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and if you missed that message, I would encourage you to pick it up. But uh, these guys were alive at the same time. They had the same experience, and that was that they were exiles. They were living as captives in a foreign land. They were from uh, Judah, lived in Jerusalem. They were taken as captives 900 miles away uh, to live in the kingdom of Babylon. And they were of the noble and royal family. And they were just going to be indoctrinated into what it meant to be a Babylonian. They were going to attempt to strip from them their language, their culture, their heritage, uh, their religion, uh, the literature, everything about them. The Babylonians said, we are going to strip that from you. We're going to indoctrinate you. And you are going to be a servant and a tool of the Babylonian empire. And Daniel, his name, it's important to understand what his name means. His name means God is my judge. God is my judge. But the Babylonians, they renamed him along with, you know, the other three Hebrew children. They renamed Daniel to Belteshazzar, gave him a new name. It was a common practice in those those days that when they were overtaken, the king whom you served would give you a new name, a new name, stripping you of everything, or re-identifying you. We see that God does that too throughout Scripture. When someone comes to know him, he changes Abram's name to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. He changes Paul's name from Saul to Paul. He changes Joshua's name from Hosea to Joshua. He gives us a new name. He identifies us as who he created and called us to be. And Daniel's new name was an attempt to strip from him his identity, and his focus, and everything about him. And as I was thinking about this story, because it wasn't on my list originally to talk about, since then I've added a whole other bunch of stories that I forgot, but I just really got this sense over and over again that what we needed to hear, maybe somebody, maybe, maybe somebody online, maybe it's just me, is that God will shut the mouths of the lions in our lives. It is God who shuts the mouths of the lions in our lives. I don't know about you, but I am not good at sitting still. I am not good when God says, be still and know that I am God. I want to be active and know that you're God, right? I want to, I want to go about, I want to do things. I want to accomplish things. I want to solve problems. Like I don't even trust you to solve my problems because I think I can solve my problem better than you. Let me be in control. Let me defend myself. You got a problem with me? Come tell me. I don't know about you, one thing I've discovered in the last few months and going to counseling and things like that is I like to have an enemy. Because if I have an enemy, then I can compete. If I don't have an enemy, I don't know how to win. You ever make up enemies? Nobody else? Like I was watching the last dance about, you know, Michael Jordan and he would just create slights so he would go out and compete. He would just like, oh, you got to, he would imagine they had a problem. Take one word they said, and then that was the fuel for him to go out and compete. As I watched that three times, I <laughs> realized that that's what I do. I find an enemy, and I say, let's go. I'll show you. 
I like to defeat my enemies. And I think we all have lions in our lives, right? They're all, they're enemies in our lives that will come against us, situations that will arise, problems that we'll face, and we attempt to get up and fight right away, fight. We want to silence the lions in our lives, silence things that are going on. But as I read this story, I look at Daniel, and Daniel seemed to possess a quality characteristic that God, I think, is trying to work in me, and that is he just trusted that God would shut the mouths of the lions. He survived the lion's den. He survived the pit. And not only that, he prospered in it and through it and because of it. So how do we survive the difficulties, the lion's den proverbially in our lives? I think Daniel's story here is, is a picture and a window for us to see how we survive and how God works in the midst of that. As I told you, Daniel was a, a captive, a refugee, probably taken around the time as, as a teenager. Some, some commentators suggest maybe he was 15, 16 years old. Royal, uh, the royal uh, noble family of, of the Hebrews, taken because he was brilliant and smart and then indoctrinated and they renamed him. Our story takes place in chapter 6. You can read Daniel's little bit of his history in chapter 1. Chapter 6, by the time we get there, they estimate that Daniel was maybe 70 years old. So he'd been in Babylon 50-ish years, 50-ish years, as a captive, in exile, stripped from his homeland, never ever seen as an equal to anybody else, never ever seen as a Babylonian, always going to be the odd man out, always going to be the guy that that shouldn't be there, but he's there, tried to strip him of everything that he has. And and we find him in chapter 6 as an, as a, let's say, a seasoned man, not going to say old, right? A seasoned man experienced individual, 50 plus years to get from where he came to where he is. It opens in chapter 6, speaking of a further kind of disruption in Daniel's life. Last week in the Tower of Babel, we ended on the idea of disruption. We talked about distrust, disobedience, and disruption. Daniel's life was one big disruption, stripped away, Right, just completely disrupted, never to return to where he was born in his homeland, just disrupted. But we saw that last week that disruption is not always God's punishment. A lot of times it's God's mercy and his grace that disruption is direction and salvation, even if it isn't salvation or direction that you want, because his God's purpose is bigger than you and me, right? It's not just about you and me. Daniel's life was one big disruption, and he just seemed to be able to embrace the disruption in his life. That's what we talked about last week. We have to embrace God's disruptions. Embrace God's plan when it isn't our plan. Embrace God's scattering. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they embraced the disruption that God brought into their life. And they, had to, they seemingly had a sense that it wasn't just for them, it was gonna be for future generations. So don't forget what Daniel's name means. God is my judge. And we open in, in chapter six, and we see that Daniel has, has been promoted. He's been promoted and he's prospered in the kingdom because of what God is doing in his life and because of his character. And chapter six opens like this in verse one. It says, Darius the Mede, decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. So the king took the whole nation and empire of Babylon, divided into 120, let's call them states, and then he put 120 governors over those, and then he put three people that were going to be in charge over those people, and then Daniel, he was just just a talented individual. He was gifted, and his his character and the way that he worked and the way that he, he went about things just continued to prove how capable he was, and the king was going to promote him to the second person in charge of the entire empire. Kind of reminds me of Joseph in Egypt. Joseph was taken as a captive and sold into slavery and became the second most powerful person in Egypt, a foreigner. This is Daniel. It's amazing. This doesn't just happen, right? You don't just get taken as a captive and a refugee and then be put into the second most powerful position in an entire empire. Only God 
can do that. The disruption has taken Daniel from being part of the royal noble family of Hebrew, the Hebrews to probably, arguably, the most powerful empire on the face of the earth in that time, the second person in control. But guess what? Daniel's prosperity brings persecution. Brings persecution. And this is what he's going to deal with, another disruption. It said, Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way of Daniel. They begin to search for some fault. Why? Because they don't like him. Because he's going to be their boss. And he's a Hebrew. In the way that he was handling governmental affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Faithful, responsible, trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. You ever had a candidate that maybe you were excited that was going to run for public office and you thought, oh man, this person is great, they're clean, and then they announce their candidacy and all of a sudden the dirt begins to come out, (laughs) right? All of a sudden the thing that they did 35 years ago, you know, comes out and they made a tweet, you know, or they made a post and then all of a sudden all this craziness comes out. Like the moment you get, start to get promoted and get some responsibility is the moment that people start to come after you, right? And the moment people start to take a look at your life and come with a fine tooth comb over everything. They did this with Daniel and they concluded he's faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. They're like, we got no dirt on this guy as it relates to governmental affairs. So the only thing we've got is we're going to use his religion against him. We're going to use his faith against him. That's what we're going to do. And that's what they decided to do. So then they, they say, the administrators and the high officers went to the king and they said, long live the king, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. No, you're not. Not Daniel. He's one of you. So you're not all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors. They think a lot about themselves, don't they? That the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give the orders for the next 30 days. Any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. I don't know about you, but they, what they do is, it's really interesting. They, they, all of this, let's say it's 100 and, and, and we'll say there's 120 governors and there's three administrators, so minus one. So what is that? 122 people. 122 people trying to bring down one person. One person. And they're going at length. Why? They just don't like him because he's prospering. And they go to this extent that they're going to they're gonna make a law that says you can't pray to anybody else. And then they're going to appeal to the ego of the king. The Babylonians thought their kings were, were kind of divine. And that's why they say sign this into law. Because they had a belief that if the king signed it into law, he was speaking on behalf of the divine. Therefore, that law could never be revoked. So the king could sign a law that would, allow, would not allow the king to revoke the law. They know what they're doing. All this energy expended on someone who's just faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. All this energy. So the king, he signs it. But listen to this. Here's what Daniel does. This is Daniel's response to the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, 900 miles away. And he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. But here's the thing. The law is only in effect for 30 days. If I'm Daniel and I know that the punishment of this law is is that I'm going to be thrown into a pit of lions, I'm thinking, God, I'll take a siesta for 30 days and we'll pick back up when this is over. (laughs) Anybody else? I'm thinking like self-preservation. I've been doing this 50 plus years, a month without uh, praying. Or maybe I'll just pray in private. I'll close the windows. See, his first response to the law was to pray three times a day, just that he had always done. Let's say he'd he'd done that for 55 years, if he was 15. Let's say 50 years. He'd pray three times a day towards Jerusalem. He'd always done it. It was his habit. It was his character. It was who he was. That no matter, they can change my name. They can change my language. They can try to change my religion. They can strip me of my culture. They can strip me of my heritage. They can attempt to, but they're never going to change that God is my judge. That God is my God. 
What else is interesting about Daniel is, is we will not read anywhere where he tries to defend himself or where he tries to talk the king out of the law. If the king was going to make him the second most powerful person in the land, don't you think he would have had the influence to maybe weasel his way into the conversation? Maybe they did it behind his back and say, hey, yo, King Darius, should we really do this? Is it really that big of a deal if someone prays to anyone else? He doesn't do any of that. He just prays. I don't like that in my humanity. If there's a problem, my default is not to pray. I'm sorry, God's working on me. My default is to do. I'm going to avoid the lion's den at all cost. Pray about it. You go pray about it. <laughs> that's, that's what Daniel does. We're, we're reading it, we're like, of course he prays. I would pray. I'm spiritual. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. He's asking for God's help. So they went, how did they, how did they know he was praying? Because he did it every day at the same time with his windows open. They knew. They trapped him. So they went straight to the king and reminded him of his law. Did you not sign a law for the next 30 days that any person who praised anyone divine or human except to you, your majesty, will be thrown at the den of lions? Well, yes, the king replied. The decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, deception, manipulation. Well, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, see, 55 years later, he's still just a captive. That's how they see him. He's ignoring your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of his predicament, but he couldn't. The king was powerless. He was powerless. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Hey, your majesty, you know, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders to have Daniel be arrested and thrown into the pit or the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve faithfully, rescue you. That's all that King Darius has. All he's got, the only hope King Darius has now is a God he doesn't even believe in. He says, Your God, Daniel. I think it's amazing. The things that we put our trust and hope and faith in may be powerful, may seem powerful, may be effective, but at the end of the day, they are powerless to save us when we need it the most. I mean, Daniel's the second most powerful dude in Babylon. The King Darius is probably the most powerful dude in the world at this time. Not even he can save Daniel. Because Daniel's name is God is my judge. Daniel watched Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace and saw another one appear within them. Daniel had a history of seeing God's hand in his life. Daniel, that's why he trusted in God. He prayed. But God doesn't answer his prayer. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight and I have not wronged you, your majesty. I said that God didn't answer Daniel's prayer, according to me, because the prayer would have been, skip the lion's den. God did answer Daniel's prayer, and he helped him, and he rescued him. But why is Daniel in the pit in the first place? What has he done except what's right? What has he done except be faithful, responsible, and trustworthy? They found no fault in him. No fault. They found no fault in Jesus either. I think one of the things I discern from this and a lesson that we could maybe all take is is that whenever you do what's right, there will not be people to, not everyone will rejoice and celebrate with you. Not everyone will come along and say, (laughs) doing what's right. Matter of fact, well, there are those people. They will rejoice and celebrate with you just quietly. But the people that come out, 
You want to know who the real lions in the story are? They're Daniel's buddies. They're the other officials. What does come out often when we do the right thing are enemies, naysayers, critics, people who want to comment on our lives. They don't want to lift a finger to do anything, but they're just looking to find fault. Because success, prosperity at times brings out jealousy and bitterness in other people. They want to tear you down. It's like crabs in a bucket. You ever heard that analogy? You put crabs in a bucket, one crab, a daring crab, brave crab, making his way out. What do the other crabs do? Rather than build a rope, they just pull each other down. And they never get out of the bucket. I think we have a culture of buckets in a, crabs in a bucket. Right? And, and we put out our successes, and we put out that we're doing the right thing. And then along come the crabs, and they just start typing. Right? And they just start typing. Or they just make comments. Or they say things. But I'm doing what's right. I don't know about you. I was very naive when I became the pastor. Of course, I was 28 years old. Didn't have a lot of experience. And I thought, man, everyone's just going to love me. There's going to be, we're, we're just going to make decisions together. And it's right. It's in the best interest of the church. No one's going to have any problems, have any issues. Well, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. And I'm not saying I was always right. But when I believed it was from God and it was right, and people told me that I was wrong and I was going to ruin things, I'm thinking, whoa, I didn't know we were on different teams. I didn't, because I, 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 at my core, I, I want to be celebrated. I want to be validated. I'm a performer. I, that's what I like to do, not just get up here and perform as entertainment, but I like to accomplish things. I want to know that, hey, do you like my message? Did you like when I said this? How did it make you feel? Oh, please tell me that you like me. Did you like my decision? Oh, I had to, I had to correct you. Was that okay? I mean, it, the, the conflict and the narrative inside of me is nutso sometimes. And I've learned if you live by the praise, you'll die by the criticism. The question is, can we do what's right even if it doesn't benefit us? Even if it, it doesn't, it will never benefit us in the short term while we're on earth. Can we, can we, can we do that? Because I, I'm discovering, not just in this part of my life as, as working here, but I'm discovering that when God asks us to do what's right, it's very, uh, very seldom is it the most comfortable and convenient and safest thing to do. However you define safety. If you define safety as the absence of criticism and people coming against you, well, then we'll, we're never going to do what God's asking us to do. Ever. Ever. If, if you think that God's plan for you is comfort and convenience, then you're sorely mistaken. I know we've developed a whole theology around that. It's not true. Yes, God prospers us from the inside out. Yes, God gives us resources to use and to whom he can trust people with more resources. He gives them more to build his purpose and his kingdom. But, but convenience and comfort and safety, ha, those are not always hallmarks of God's plan. Every story we've looked at, you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, God. I, that's not really what I want to do. That doesn't feel good. But I, I heard that, that somebody once said this, that the safest place to be is just radically obedient to God. Just radically obedient. And just doing what's right. Right? Like the best advice we're going to hear all day, not from me, from God, is just why don't you be faithful, responsible, and trustworthy? That's not exciting. That isn't sexy advice. I don't think you get a lot of YouTube hits with that. That's not stuff we want to hear. Now, but we do want to hear when we're dead that if somebody got up to eulogize you like I did Sarah Snodgrass last week and said she was faithful, she was responsible, she was trustworthy, and here we are today. How many of those who have gone before us just did the right thing and it didn't benefit them, but it was the right thing? It benefited someone else. Wow. I, so I, I look at Daniel. I don't, I don't even see him protesting. He's not even protesting. He's just walking to the lion's den. Head held high. God is my judge. Not defending anything. What does he have to defend? 
He could defend them on why it's right that he should pray to God and how they're all godless heathens and they should die. And He can do all that. But God is his judge. I read a, a book one time, and there's a movie but, called Unbroken about Louis Zamperini. And I'm sure it's this book. It may be another book about a POW. But either way, when they found out they were going to be rescued, he survived a POW camp in, in Japan during World War II. And when they discovered that they were going to be liberated and they were still the Japanese soldiers that were there, he said that every man in the camp, and they'd been there starved to death, dignity attempted to be taken from them, everything, they lined up in order of their country and in order of rank. And with their heads held high, they marched out of the camp as soldiers, not as prisoners. Those in the camps who saw themselves as soldiers and not prisoners survived. And there's something unique about understanding our identity of who we are, whose we are, who our judge is. That Daniel did not fight to preserve his position. He got on his knees because he recognized it was God who promoted him to that position. If God puts you somewhere, somewhere, you do not have to fight to keep yourself there. But if you put yourself there, you're going to have to fight to keep yourself there. But when God promotes you, no one can touch you. No thing can touch you. And he will shut the mouths of the lions. Daniel had prayed 55 years, three times a day, and he finds himself in the bottom of a pit in darkness and in silence, and no one can help him. What was that like? For a whole night. You ever gone to the zoo and looking down in like the tiger and the lion pit or the, those big, huge gorilla things, and you're just like, do you ever think, what if I were to fall in here? Maybe it's just me. Like I had this, like my, my legs get kind of nervous. Like I might fall in there. I want to jump in there. Like I don't, <laughs> you know, like him. He just <laughs> tossed in, and he's in the midst of his enemies, the lions. I believe he was physically in a pit of lions, but I really think the stories about the lions that we encounter in life, the enemies that we encounter, the people, the situations, the disruptions, the difficulties, the accusations, the attacks, the being maligned, and all these things that will come against us, we really just have to learn to just let God shut the mouths of the lions. How do we survive the lions, Then, Just be faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. That's what we have to do. Nothing, like I said, super you know, amazing about that. I think it's amazing if we can do that over the course of our lives. I think it's amazing if we can just do what's right because it's right. Because God said we can wrestle with it, we can doubt through it, we can all those things, but just this is what God said and this is what I will do. Come hell, high water, Lion's den, loss of position, loss of status, whatever the case may be, God is my judge. And I will do it. And, and, and we read, right, that, that, that God, God did it. There wouldn't be a story if he didn't. If, if, if Daniel ended up just a pile of bones at the bottom of a pit, we wouldn't be reading this story. But he did it. He wasn't afraid of the suffering. Matthew Henry, a great commentator, said that, that we should not... We, let me read it because I'm going to mess it up. We must not omit duty for fear of suffering. We must not omit duty for fear of suffering. And that if you want to prosper, and everybody in here and online, you want to prosper, don't you? You want to move forward. You want, and I'm not talking about just physical success, but you want to know that you're moving forward and prospering. I'm telling you, there is no prospering without going through the pit. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. God will take you down and bring you up. Joseph went into the pit. There's a proverbial pit, lion's den, that every person we read about in Scripture goes through. And God prospers us through it. And he's in there with us. That's the thing we discover when we're in the lion's den, in the middle of everything, that God is present in the middle of it. And then we learn this, that when God prospers you and me, it's not just for you and me. Listen to the, what the conversation that happens between Darius and Daniel after this. It says, the king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. They had them thrown in the lion's den along with their wives and children. Ruthless. 
And the lions leapt up on them and tore them apart before they ever hit the floor of the den. Shoot them up. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race, nation, and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For Listen to this. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. He has no beginning and he has no end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Yeah. All because he was faithful, he was responsible, and he was trustworthy. We've got no record of Daniel witnessing to Darius. We've got no record of Daniel trying to convince Darius and Nebuchadnezzar, whomever he came into contact with, that he needed to believe in the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh. We've got moments where God works through him and displays himself. But all we have is an individual who understood that God was his judge and he was faithful and he was responsible and he was trustworthy. And just imagine that through our faithfulness, responsibleness or responsibility and trustworthiness, that God can impact the heart of a king. That the disruption of being stripped away from his homeland was direction and salvation, not just for Daniel, but for the future generations and for that king, the most influential person in that time, to recognize he was powerless, and yet God was powerful. And all Daniel had to do was sit and let God shut the mouths of the lions. How do we do that? I don't know. I'm learning to sit and trust that God is faithful. I think we can start to take an inventory and ask ourselves, what positions are we in that we fought to get there? How much are we fighting to maintain position and, 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 and whatever possessions and, and reputation and all this kind of stuff that we've built when we just need to look and say, God, what have you given me? Where have you placed me? How can I just be faithful with what you've given me, responsible with what's before me, and trustworthy no matter how big or small? How can I let my actions speak for themselves? How can I let my life speak for itself? How can I allow you to prosper me on your timetable and still trust you when prosperity seems to be going the other way, when you take me down before you take me up? And and then I think about what David wrote in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. But the table is prepared in the presence of our enemies and the presence of our lions and the presence of our difficulties that maybe the best thing that we could do right now, whatever den that we may be in, is just look for the table that God has prepared and sit. And when God prepares a table, there's sustenance on that table. And partake of his goodness. Partake of his faithfulness. And let the enemies be the one freaking out. I think Daniel slept pretty good that night, and the king had a horrible night's sleep. The safest place we can be is in the center of God's will. No matter how difficult, dangerous, inconvenient, and uncomfortable it may seem, that's where we need to be, to just be obedient. So my encouragement to us today is attempting to find the table, to sit at the table, and make just a vow. Number one, God, you're my judge. Number two, I'm going to endeavor to be faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. And I'll let you do what it is that you do. And I'll let you work, and I'll let you move, and I'll let you add, and you take away. We used to sing that song, he gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. I like the give part. I don't like the take away part, right? But he gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. And he's faithful, and he's good. 
He's good. So, whatever the lions are in your life, as I said at the beginning, I just felt like I should say today, he will shut the mouths of the lions as you sit and trust and depend on him. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me as we conclude. Those of you that are going to come forward and, and help me with prayer, I ask you to come forward now and just encouragement to you, whether you're here or online, if you need prayer, we'd love to agree with you, lay hands on you, pray for you, see what God can do in your life and your situation. But would you just take a moment as we wind down and just, just ask the Holy Spirit, ask him, how do I find this table? Am, am, am I trusting in you? Help me to be faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. Just ask him, what do you want me to do with, with this today? Father, my prayer has been many times that you would just kill the lions in my life. Or I could avoid them completely. But Lord, I pray that you would help me and each of us to, to be able to sit in the midst of them and trust you. And to find our identity and our sense of wholeness and rootedness in you and not in other things, in other people, in possessions or titles or anything that is powerless to define or to save us. But may we partake of all that you have for us, of your goodness, your faithfulness, your correction, your pruning, Father, and the internal prosperity that you bring. I do pray that every person watching every person in this room, that we would prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Bring us soul prosperity, I pray, Father. Wholeness of, of thought and, and of, of, of emotion and, and every part of who you created us to be. We would prosper internally from the inside out and we would not look for things externally to, to give us any sense of, of identity or, or, or anything that we're looking for. We would find it in you as we sang today. Nothing else Nothing else but you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing healing and restoration and more so just peace that passes and transcends understanding and guards our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So, Father, I pray that you would do, just as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that you would do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we could ask for or imagine at the power that is at work within us, and that is the power of Jesus. And we thank you for shutting the mouths of the lions in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks for joining us online today. If you're new here or if you made the decision to follow Jesus, we would love to connect with you and let you know how to take your next steps. Real quick, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will get in touch soon. You can also visit our website at faithcommunity.co to learn more about the church. And stay in touch on social media. Shoot us a DM over on Facebook or Instagram if you have any questions, and you can even share this service with your friends. If you're joining us on YouTube, make sure to hit that red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. Another way we want to stay connected is through prayer. If there's something going on in your life that you would like someone to pray with you about, please let us know. Email prayer at faithcommunity.co or submit a request through the app and someone from our team will pray with you and whatever is going on in your life. Thanks again for being here today and we'll see you next time.